Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering cystic fibrosis. This is part of pediatrics. Um, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please help support me, help support my channel. How can you do this? Like this video. You know you're going to love it. Just like this video now so you don't forget. Um, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Engage with me in the comments. Let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover more of. When you comment, that really helps the algorithm so that my videos show up on more, on more people's pages. I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. By the way, guys, do not forget, I have a live NCLEX review. It's going to be the first part of a multi-part series. It's going to be live on YouTube on Sunday, the 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, if you go on my channel, you'll see the information in the description of the book that you're going to need for that live. I provided the name of the book and the ISBN number. From what I understand, since the day that I made the announcement about the book, they've doubled the price of the book, which is absolutely ridiculous. So I encourage you, go to your local library, see if you can get that book used. I'm not gonna be able to share my book on the live. So I encourage you to have your own copy so that you can follow along. All right, guys, let's get started, cystic fibrosis. So. Take a look, look what it says. Cystic fibrosis is an inherited autosomal recessive trait. Professor D, do I need to know that it's autosomal recessive? Yes, they ask about it a lot. So you need to know that it's autosomal recess recessive. The affected child inherits the defective gene from both parents with an overall risk of one in four if both parents carry the gene. That's important to know. So. What they're saying is both parents carry the gene, there's a 25% chance that the child will have not the gene, but the actual disorder, okay? Same thing with sickle cell. Let's keep going. What's happening in cystic fibrosis? It says increased viscosity, that means thickness, okay? Increased viscosity of mucus gland secretions a striking elevation of sweat electrolytes, what comes on your sweat, sodium, right, chloride, an increase in several organic and, and enzymatic constituents of saliva and abnormalities in autonomic nervous system function. Let's keep going. Children with cystic fibrosis demonstrate an increase in sodium and chloride in both saliva and sweat. Very important to know. I don't know why I didn't underline that. Very important to know. So we're going to see an increase in both sodium and saliva of this patient in uh, sodium saliva, <laughs> sodium and chloride in the patient's saliva and sweat. This characteristic is the basis for the sweat chloride diagnostic test. So they just told us when we're trying to diagnose this patient and figure out, okay, do they really have cystic fibrosis or something else? What's that diagnostic test? It's the sweat chloride diagnostic test. Okay. Moving on. The primary factor and the one that's responsible for many of the clinical manifestations of the disease is, look at this guys, mechanical obstruction caused by increased viscosity of mucus gland secretion. So let's talk about this for a second, guys. Look at what they're telling us. They're telling us that the biggest reason that we're seeing all most of these clinical manifestations in the patient is because they are making just this very, very thick, very, very tenacious sputum. And guess what? That sputum is clogging everything up. It's clogging everything up. You're going to see. Let's keep going. Instead of forming thin, freely flowing secretion, the mucus glands produce thick mucoprotein that accumulates and dilates them. Small passages in organs such as pancreas and bronchioles become obstructed as the secretions precipitate or coagulate to form concretions in glands and ducts. So all of that wordy stuff right? It's telling us that these thick secretions are clogging everything up, clogging up the pancreas. And last time I checked, pancreas was important for enzymes. Remember lipase, amylase, pancreas was important for insulin production and release. Remember the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans, and it's also clogging up the bronchioles. So, you know, this patient is going to have difficulty, what? Breathing. Let's keep going. 
The disturbed function is reflected in bulky stools that are frothy. Why are they frothy from the undi undigested fat, statorrhea? And foul smelling from the putrefi um, putrefied protein, isotorrhea. Why is that fat being undigested? Think about it, guys. The pancreas. The pancreas is being clogged up. And again, pancreas is responsible for those enzymes, such as, you know, those enzymes that break down um, the fat. Lipase. So they're going to have the fatty um, stool because it's not being broken down. What does this? I hate when they do this. S at, no, here it is. CFRD. Okay, so that CFRD stands for cystic fibrosis related diabetes. So let's talk about this before I even get into it. Remember, in cystic fibrosis, the patient's making all of this thick. It's not even thin, guys. Number one, they're making too much of the mucus. And number two, it's thick. It's tenacious. It's sticky. It's not moving well, right? They're producing all of this that's clogging up. One of the organs they're clogging up is the pancreas. And remember, the insulin is made in the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. If the pancreas is not functioning properly, they're not making insulin properly. So the patient's going to be what? Diabetic. It makes sense. Take a look. Cystic fibrosis related diabetes is reported to be the most common complication associated with cystic fibrosis. The primary characteristic of cystic fibrosis um, related di diabetes is. What type of um, insulin deficiency? Severe. Severe insulin deficiency. Why? Because the pancreas is being damaged by all of this thick, tenacious sputum that's just clogging it up. Okay? So we're seeing severe insulin deficiency as a result of beta cell dysfunction. Very important for you guys to know. By the way, this is a, going to be part one of a two-part series because uh, cystic fibrosis is a very heavy. And you're going to be questioned a lot on, when you get to peds on this, so I don't want to rush through it. All right. What did it say? All right. The presence of adequate insulin appears to be a key factor in maintaining an adequate nutritional status. So to keep that pa patient um, healthy nutritionally, look at what it's saying the key factor is adequate insulin. That pancreas isn't making insulin or it's not making the insulin the way it's supposed to. So a key factor in keeping that patient's nutritional status up to par is what? Adequate insulin. So insulin is going to be very important with this type of patient. Let's keep going. Experts continue to recommend high fat, high calorie diet in cystic fibrosis patients. Let's keep moving. Symptoms are produced by stagnation. When you see that word stagnation, guys, that means not moving, it's just sitting there. And we know, especially fluid, when fluid is just sitting, it's not moving. That is a um, perfect medium for bacteria to grow, for a patient to get infection, right? We want fluid to be free flowing. Symptoms are produced by stag stagnation of mucus in the airways. And by the way, something else that happens when that thick mucus is just sitting there, what happens? It gets even thicker. Symptoms are produced by stagnation of mucus in the airways with eventual bacterial colonization leading to destruction of lung tissues. Let's stop right there. This is an important concept for you to know, not only for cystic fibrosis, guys, this is across the board. Whenever a patient has fluid, blood, any type of fluid that is not moving, that is a perfect medium, a perfect environment for bacteria to grow. And it's going to put that patient at risk for infection, just as you see right here. So let's keep going. So now um, this patient's at risk for infection of the lungs, the abnormally viscous, as in thick, the abnormally viscous and tenacious secretions are difficult to expectorate. That means to cough up, right? To get rid of, to expectorate and gradually obstruct the bronchi and bronchioles causing scattered areas of bronchiectasis, atelectasis and hyperinflation. Why hyperinflation? Because they're unable to cough up all that thick, tenacious sputum. So instead of breathing off all that CO2, what are they doing? They're holding it in. 
The stagnant mucus also offers a favorable environment for bacterial growth. Oh my gosh, this is like a third time they've told us the same thing, except in a different way. You think that's going to be a test question? Absolutely. Let's keep going. Fertility. Fertility can be inhibited by highly viscous cervical secretions. So now this person can be sterile. This woman can be sterile. Why? Because the, the secretions in the cervix is so thick and viscous. Nothing's getting through that bad boy. So let's keep going. Fertility can be inhibited by highly viscous cervical secretions. Look, it acts as a plug blocking sperm entry. Most men, 95% with cystic fibrosis are sterile. Physical growth may be restricted as a result of decreased absorption of nutrients, including vitamins and fat. Remember, they're not absorbing, they're not absorbing these vitamins and fats. They're not breaking down or metabolizing these vitamins and uh, fats. That's why it's important for them to have a high diet of fat, right? And not only that high diet of fat, high calories, the calories, they need the energy to fight off infection, healing. So let's keep going. Physical growth may be restricted as a result of decreased absorptions of nutrients, including vitamins and fats, increased oxygen demand for pulmonary function, and delayed bone growth. Yes, that patient's going to have increased demand for oxygen. They can't even cough up or get rid of all that thick, tenacious sputum. It's harder for them to breathe. So the work of breathing becomes even more. So the demand for oxygen becomes even more. Absolutely. Diagnostic evaluation. Universal newborn screening for cystic fibrosis is now required by law in all states in the U.S. The newborn screening test consists of immunoreactive trypsinogen, that's your IRT analysis, performed on a dried spot of blood, which may be followed by direct analysis of DNA for the presence of um, that triangle, I'm assuming it's delta F. 508 mutation or other mutations on the same dried blood test. Blood spot, excuse me, guys. A positive screen indicates persistent, I'm going to try to pronounce this word, guys, I can't speak, hypertrypsinogenemia and does not diagnose cystic fibrosis, but it identifies infants that are at risk for cystic fibrosis. So that blood spot test, it doesn't diagnose the patient is having cystic fibrosis, but it does tell us, okay, this patient is at high risk for having cystic fibrosis, okay? Further testing is needed to confirm or rule out cystic fibrosis. The consistent finding of abnormally, so when they say consistent, guys, that means over and over and over and over again, okay? This has been consistent. The consistent finding of abnormally high, again, Sodium and chloride, those are the two um, electrolytes. Sodium and chloride concentrations in the sweat is a unique characteristic of cystic fibrosis. Parents may report that their infant tastes salty when they kiss him or her. The quantitative sweat chloride test, remember that's the test that they do um, to diagnose the patient, involves stimulating the production of sweat with special device, collecting the sweat on filter paper, and measuring the sweat electrolytes. And if it's abnormally high, we know the patient's got what? Cystic fibrosis. Let's keep going. Normally, sweat chloride content is less than 40 milliequivalents per liter with a mean of 18 milliequivalent uh, per liter. A chloride concentration that's greater than 60 in a child six months of age or older is diagnostic for cystic fibrosis. Let's not miss what we just saw here, guys. Normally, it should be less than 40. The mean, the average should be about 18. So in a child that's six months or older, if it's higher than 60, if it's higher than 60, it's cystic fibrosis. A concentration between 40 and 59 is indeterminable, so they can't say for sure it's cystic fibrosis, and a repeat test will have to be performed in one to two months. But definitely higher than 60, yep, that's what it is. Chest x-ray, when you see that word radio radiography, they're talking about x-ray. Chest x-ray reveals characteristic 
patchy atelectasis and obstructive emphysema. They're holding on to all that CO2. They can't breathe it out because of all that thick mucus that's clogging those airways. Okay, so that patient's going to have hyperinflation of the lungs and they're going to be in an acidic state because we know carbon dioxide or carbon diacid is acidic. And since they can't breathe it out, all of that carbon dioxide is staying in their body. They're going to be in an acidic state. Let's take a look at this box, clinical manifestations of cystic fibrosis. Meconium ileus, I put a star next to it. You better know it. That patient is going to have abdominal distension. Nothing's moving. Think about how thick that mucus is clogging everything up. Failure to pass stools. Remember, especially when that infant that's born, we expect them to pass that stool within that first 24 to 48 hours, right? Other clinical manifestations. GI manifestations, they're going to have large, bulky, loose. This is, I don't know why I didn't highlight this, but this is your key, frothy and foul-smelling stools. You see frothy, foul-smelling, and you and peas, you better be thinking cystic fibrosis. Weight loss, tissue wasting, failure to grow, failure to thrive, distended abdomen. We're going to see evidence of deficiency of the fat-soluble vitamins. Remember ADEC? Those are your fat-soluble vitamins, A-D-E-K. Pulmonary manifestations, wheezings. Guys, that wheezing sound is the sound of air trying to get through a clogged airway. That's the sound of air trying to get through an obstructed or partially obstructed airway. What's, what's obstructing the airway? All of that thick, tenacious mucus. They may have a non-productive cough, increased dyspnea, difficulty breathing, paroxysmal cough, progressive involvement. When you see that word progressive, that means as time goes on, it only gets worse. That's what that progressive means in the medical field, okay? Progressive involvement, overinflated barrel-shaped chest. Think of your COPD patients, your emphysema, your bronchitis patients, right? They can't get rid of that CO2. It stays trapped in the lungs. They have that barrel chest in that acidic state. Cyanosis, why? Decreased oxygen. Clubbing of the fingers and toes, again, that decreased oxygen, they're more in an acidic state. They have all that CO2 in them. Bronchopneumonia. They are absolutely at risk for infection, especially in the lungs because you have all this thick, tenacious fluid that's not moving. That is a perfect environment or medium for um, infection. All right, guys, um, I have to run to a meeting, but I wanted to make sure I made this video for you before I left. So this is your part one of cystic fibrosis. If I have time today, I'm going to go ahead and make a part two and upload it. If not, you guys will get it on the next video. Please, please, guys, I'm asking you to please support me any way you can. And also in the description, there's other ways you can support me if you want to be kind enough to do so. But I'm asking you to please support me, support this channel and help it grow. If I'm doing something for you to help you, I'm asking you to please do something to help me as well. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. And you guys will catch me on the next video.